One of the more astonishing journeys that Paul took as a missionary was when he visited Athens. We see this in Acts chapter 17, and Paul is dismayed because he sees the power of the Athenians and the Romans, and he sees all the gods and goddesses that are present. And he was kind of taken back because he didn't really know where to start with his confrontation to the people about accepting Jesus Christ. But Paul, just like in other places, he allowed the Holy Spirit to work with him, and that's what God asked us to do. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at Athens, and Paul was there. I don't know if any of you have ever visited Athens, but they have some of the great buildings and architecture of all times. In fact, a lot of the work that's done, architecture that's done in America, is featured and copied after the Greeks. So we're going to look at some of those things today, and as we do, let's begin with a word of prayer, and remember that the Lord gives to you the power that you need as his people to make a difference in the lives of others, and one way is through prayer. So let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would guide us now as we study about Paul's journey to Athens, about the work that he did there, about the truths that he taught. Help it to be an inspiration to us to walk closer with you and to be a missionary as we carry the word of Christ to those around us. Thank you, Lord, for all you do and for all you mean. In Jesus' name, amen. Focusing in on Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> Those of you who've been tuning in on YouTube, you know I'm Tim Bell and I'm from Northside Baptist Church. And I be, bring greetings to you from the church. We hope that you'll attend if you do not have a church home somewhere. If you're looking or if you're a member and haven't been there for a while, we hope that you'll come back and be a part of our ministry. We have a lot of good things going on. We have a great leadership, and we have a lot of different programs and outreach that would be designed specifically for you and for the help that you could give to us. Okay, so let's look at <clears throat> Acts chapter 17, and, and uh, Paul begins in verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, Athens, Greece, as you recall, that was a center of great thought. You know, that's where a lot of the great philosophers came from. Plato, Aristotle, you know, some of those Socrates that you read about. Uh, and anyway, they were a, a great uh, city of reasoning and of logic and of creativity. And I mean, you, you, you really couldn't get to a better place as far as mind stimulation than Greece. And Paul is in Athens, and he looks around, and he sees all of these gods and goddesses. Now, whenever uh, Rome took over Greece, they changed a lot of the names of the gods and goddesses. So you may know them by the Roman names. But before they were Roman gods and goddesses, they were Greek. And basically, all the Romans did, they um, you know picked up on the same beliefs that the Greeks had as far as their gods and how they came about, etc. But they gave them different names. Uh, like, for instance, uh, Poseidon, you know, that was the uh, Greek name, and uh, Neptune, that was the Roman name. And, um, you, know, and you, you know, you have Mercury and Mars, and, and uh, you know, a lot of these are the same, the same gods and goddesses, just with different names. So Paul's looking at all of these gods and goddesses, all these statues, and he's probably kind of dismayed because he's thinking, how in the world can I possibly tie in Jesus Christ to these people who are so instilled with their own system of, of worshiping their God. And so it says he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in a synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God. So they had a synagogue in Athens and Paul went to the synagogue and he talked to the Jews because that's who was allowed in there. And it says he also visited those who worship God. Those were probably people that we called God-fearers. They were people who believed in God, 
but did not believe in the system of Judaism. So they were not Jews, but they did believe in the same God that the Jews believed in. So they were known as God-fearers. And they were granted a lot of uh, privileges, not as many as the Jews were, but a lot of the privileges to uh, visit with the synagogue, to, to the synagogue and, and other uh, customs. Um, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So the marketplace was, was not just where they sold food. It was also um, a place where people came and discussed their issues, discussed their ideas, um, discussed politics, you know, whatever it may be. That was part of the marketplace. And they did that. And Paul went to the marketplace because he knew that's where he could meet people and talk to them about the way they were and what they were looking for and about their gods and his God and what the difference would be, etc. And so it says that, that Paul went there. Now, you notice it says, first of all, he talked to the Jews. You know, Paul, um, almost all the, um, you know, Christian missionaries went to the Jews first. Jesus did because the Jews were the ones that would know about God and they would know about God's redeeming hand and they would know that God was going to return. They just didn't know, you know, you know exactly how. And when G they, when God returned as Jesus, they rejected that because they said, no, God wouldn't come that way. He would come as an all-powerful God. And so Paul was talking to the Jews, and I'm sure he didn't get too far with them. And then he talked to the God-fearers, and he probably didn't get just real far with them, but maybe more so than with the Jews, because it's more difficult to talk to other people about an issue if they already have deep-seated beliefs it's very difficult to change that. But if they come in and they don't have any idea at all what you're talking about, then it makes a big difference and you can get into their skin somewhat. I remember uh, when I was going to build a house a long time ago when I first was married and I talked to a builder. Uh, he Actually, he was just a farmer. He was retired as a builder and he was farming. And I said, uh, if I, uh, you know, build, build me a house, will you help me? And he said, have you ever built one before? And I said, no. And he said, do you know anything about it? And I said, no, not much. And he said, okay, then I'll help you. He said, if you told me that you knew all there was to know about it and you were somebody who, you know, who uh, you know, thought that he had all the answers, then I couldn't work with you because we, we would not be able to work together. We would con have a, uh, we, we would conflict our ideas would. And so it is when Paul would proclaim the word to Jews and to God fears. They already had an understanding of who God was, and it was different than where Paul was coming from. And it was much easier for him to go to people who were totally indifferent to the gospel. He would have a better chance of getting into them. That's why Paul ended up going to the Gentiles and proclaiming God's message to them. Um, so anyway, uh, in verse 18, it says, some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Now, Epicureans, they were the ones that followed uh, Epicurus, and he was an individual who believed in pleasure. He said, you know, you're not going to be uh, on this earth long, and there's really no afterlife, so you need to take what you can get from this life and live as happy and as forcefully and as uh, pleasure-ridden that you can possibly do. And so that was his philosophy, and that were, and he, so he had some followers there. The Stoics looked at things more logically. They said, in order to get to heaven, you got to figure it out. In order to understand the gods, you got to kind of figure them out. It's not really emotional much at all, but it's more logical and reasoning. And and we get that term today. Somebody you know who is Stoic is somebody who's um, who is who, whose mind is balanced, you know, and they're not flippant and they don't deal with life uh, on feelings but instead with knowledge and logic. And so those are the two ones that he, uh, you know, were, were, were dealing with, the Epicureans and also the, the uh, Stoics. Um, the, the Stoics also believed in um, self-sufficiency. In other words, we can do this on our own. We don't have to uh, uh, rely on anyone else. No one else should rely on us. We can do it on our own. Okay, so anyway, um, he, he debated with these people. So you can see the conflict that they would have. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. 
Now, let me just say that you can't get much more of a radical theology than Christianity to say that God sent his son who died on the cross for our sins and then was resurrected from the dead and lives again and is given to us his Holy Spirit to lead us in this life. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But with the Greeks, you know, it really didn't have to make a whole lot of sense because they believed in this uh, system of gods and goddesses and their uh, theology certainly didn't make much sense either. Uh, yet Paul pushed Jesus first above all the idols and above all the other things that they were studying. And he said, there is a big difference between Jesus Christ and your gods. And he goes on to, to uh, talk about that. Verse 22, it says, Paul stood in the middle of the aerial, of the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus was a place that Paul could stand and have a um, uh, have a congregation or have an audience that he could preach to, speak to. So he did well in the marketplace, well enough to where the people thought, well, he's you know what he's saying makes sense uh, somewhat. So let's at least let him speak to more people. And so they took him, honored him by taking him to this place to where he could speak out and speak to many people. Uh, and so here's what he said. He said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every aspect. So Paul is starting off on the same uh, on the same foot that Paul himself believes in. And that's a good thing to do when you're trying to tell other people about the love of Christ is to find a common denominator between you and that person. What did we do in the past that was the same? What are how are our thoughts the same? Do we wear the same kind of clothes? Do we like the same kind of food? Do we go to the same school? Uh, did we, you know, do this or that? So, you know, try to try to get on some common ground with the individual that you're talking to. And Paul said, uh, I see that you are very religious. And you know, and Paul was a religious. He said, uh, for as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. So Paul is saying, even though I looked at all these different uh, individuals, you know, uh, uh, all the uh, gods and goddesses that you had, you know, goddess of love, God, the god of war, um, the god of peace, uh, the god of uh, farming, the god of fertility, uh, you know, what you know, what whatever it was, god or goddesses, uh, they had one. And Paul was looking at all of these, and he said, "But here's one that you mentioned. This is the unknown god." The Greeks were superstitious, were superstitious enough to where they didn't want to leave out any god. They wanted to include all the gods. And so, not knowing every god, because they knew there were a lot of them, they wanted to pay honor to those that they didn't know. Kind of like the uh, monument to the unknown soldiers, you know, those who fought bravely in the war and were killed and, and we never found their bodies and never knew for sure what happened. And so there's a site for them. And it's, you know, it's known as the grave of the unknown soldiers to pay respect to those who, who you know, we, we know almost positively were killed in war, but we don't know exactly where they're at or what happened or when it happened or where it happened. And so we can honor them this way. And so the Greeks said, we don't know about all the gods. Uh, surely if we've listed you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 gods and goddesses, and we have all these myths and all these stories about them, I'm sure that we've missed something, and we don't want to make that god or goddess mad, so we're going to offer up an altar for that particular individual, and so they did, and they called it, you know, the, the statue or the monument to the unknown gods, and Paul said, so there you go, you've, you've, you've got one here, he said, uh, I know I know who this God is. Paul said, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So Paul says, because you're ignorant of who this God may be, and you cannot list all the gods. So because of your ignorance, you have done a good thing. You've set up this altar to cover yourself. And Paul says, here again, he takes, he goes common ground where they're at. And Paul says, and so I've got something to tell you. Because you all have worshipped all these gods and goddesses, 
And because you've given this special altar for those that, for the, the God that you don't know, I can tell you who that God is. He said, you've worshiped, what you worship in ignorance, I can uncover for you. And so he's going to tell him what it is. And so if we go to the next verse, verse 30, he says, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, you know, you can read uh, the verses that were skipped here because we've jumped from the, all the way to verse 30. But, but, uh, but, but what, what you've missed is the fact that Paul says this unknown idol, that's Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the God uh, the, who, who I worship. That's the God who you, you know, that's in, based on your own uh, ad, ad, admitting, you know, this particular event. You said that you don't know. You, you haven't worshipped all the gods. You don't know who all the gods are. And so we've made this special place, that special altar for the unknown God. And Paul is saying, you don't know who Jesus is, but now you know. And the altar to the unknown God, that's who you, the, uh, the uh, unknown God is. It's Jesus Christ. And and so he explains that to him. And then he says in verse 30, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance. So Paul is saying, so you people were ignorant, you know, and, and there's that. Uh, Ignorant is not a negative connotation on being stupid or anything. It's just a lack of knowledge. So Paul is saying, because you had the lack of knowledge, you were ignorant. You did not know. But now you do know because I have told you who this God is. And the God is Jesus Christ. So that's who you made this altar to. So you see, Paul, he's kind of worked his way in. He started with the Jews, started with, uh, you know, then he, then he moved to the um uh, God-fearing people. He started in the synagogue, and he went to the marketplace. And then he went to to the uh, Ariacal Um Aropagus, Aropagus. I guess I need to study on that a little bit so I can pronounce it next time I come to it. But on the Aropagus, and so he came there, and he's able to proclaim to several people. And now he's got a greater group of people there. So Paul has gone from talking to a few people uh, about Jesus Christ, who and they you know didn't really accept him much, to now he has a, a big contention of people, and they are listening at least. At least they're listening. They're not closed down like people who have preconceived ideas, but they are listening to what Paul has to say. And so he is proclaiming to them that you have, uh, this this altar and you don't know who it goes to because you don't even know who the God that it celebrates is. And I'm telling you right now, that is Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that, look, I've come, you know, here again from the very roots to the very beginning until now. And I'm telling you and I'm showing you the importance of following Jesus Christ. And Paul says, now you're ignorant, but now you're not. The time for your ignorance is over. I have told you the good news about Jesus Christ. I've told you about him, about the whole, about the, the way that God delivered him, about the way that Jesus died, and about the way that he was resurrected. And he says, having overlooked this time of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. So Paul is saying, you have no excuse now for not repenting because you've heard the good news. You've heard about Jesus Christ. All these other gods and goddesses that you worship, uh, have they made you feel any more full? Have they given you uh, confidence? Do they make you feel happy and joyful? No, they're just stone. They don't. But this one, this God who I'm talking about, Jesus Christ, he will bring you the abundant life. He will, through the Holy Spirit, become a part of your life. He's not stone. He is a living individual. He is a living being. He will come into your life and give you what you need at the time that you need it. It is more than a stone. It's more than just uh, taking off and running out and praying to a bunch of statues. No, this is the Jesus Christ who is within you. He's not on the outside of you. Through his spirit, he was within you. And he, he uh, you know, we, we use the term, he controls you through your heartstrings. 
um, through through your um, uh, through, through your spiritual feelings, you know. So so God is working in your life, and Paul says, and that's what Jesus does, and He is the God that you have missed out on. So He's saying, try Him, you know, try Jesus. This is this is a a, a man who not only did he die for you, but he rose again. And, uh, you know, some of the Greek myths, if you read about them, they talk about people who rise again, you know, the uh, phoenix out of the dust, you know, he, he uh, that, that creature rose again. And uh, a lot of the gods and goddesses that got in fights with each other and then were defeated, you know, they would make a comeback, etc. And so Paul is saying that Jesus Christ, he made a comeback. He wasn't just somebody who stayed in the grave, but he made a comeback as well. And so you see, uh, Paul continues to move right along using their imagery and their own stories to to um, reveal to them the person of Jesus Christ. So it says, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. So Paul says, Jesus Christ is righteous. By righteous, we're, we're meaning he does the right thing. <clears throat> He's on the right side. Uh, for somebody to be righteous means that you have no sin and that you you know, have no enmity in your heart for other people and that you're perfect and that you love and you're willing to forgive and you're willing to forget and you're willing to walk with people and you're willing to help them and you're willing to give your life for them. That's righteousness. Paul says, do any of these statues offer you that? Do any of them go to the cross and die for you and offer you their righteous lives? And he says, however, you're not going to be able to get to heaven and to know God because of your righteousness. You can't do it. None of us are that righteous. None of us do the right thing all the time, constantly, and never sin. And so Paul is saying, so you have this righteousness. You have this, this, um, this power that you see through Jesus Christ, that God bestowed upon him. God is righteous, and so is Jesus. And he says, and then Paul says, he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So now Paul is summing up everything that he talked about already. So let's, let's kind of look at it quickly here. We see that Jesus Christ is God's son, he is the God that has not been identified by the Greeks. He is that God. And God, the great God, the one God, sent his son to you people. And he's given to you this message of salvation. And though you've been ignorant year after year after year, now you're not ignorant because I told you the truth. Now you're going to have to act on it. Now, because I've told you the truth, you've got to make a decision. Before you knew the truth, you didn't have to make a decision because you didn't know what decision to make. But now you know. Paul said before, your ignorance had excused you somewhat, but now it doesn't because you're not ignorant anymore. I told you. And so when we tell somebody about the Lord, or when somebody tells us about the Lord, we, um, we are responsible to do something with that. We can either reject Christ or we can accept him into our life. And Paul is saying that's that's you know that's a decision that you have to make. Are you going to accept him or reject him? But wait, Paul says, but wait, let me throw in one more thing. In order to help you make that decision, I'm going to tell you that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And because he was resurrected from the dead, he showed that his death was not a lasting death and your death is not a lasting death. But if you accept Jesus Christ and follow him and walk with him, you will, you will not taste earthly death, but you'll be with God forever. So that's your, that's your choice, Paul says. And I don't know, you know, the, the, the people, uh, many of them had different reactions and we'll talk about different reactions next week. But they had different reactions. Some heard the gospel that Paul proclaimed and, and buried it in their heart. Some of them never heard it. Some of it just, you know, kicked it away. Some of them heard it and was going to change. They, you know, I, I want to make this change. But when hard times came or temptation came along, they fell. 
And so there's all kinds of different ways that people responded, I'm sure, to Paul's message, just like today. And when Paul proclaimed this word, he knew that he did his job. He did what God had called him to do. God did not call him to save people. Paul cannot do that. He can just give the saving message to people and let the Holy Spirit save those individuals. But here again, because of free will, the individual has to make that final choice. And so Paul has proclaimed the word. He has been um, you know, looked down upon by his uh, empty philosophies, and yet a handful of people bought into it, let him preach to more people. More people heard about Jesus Christ, and now they had to make that decision. And that's the way it is with us in our lives. The Holy Spirit deals with you, even if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit deals with you day in and day out. And it's just not necessarily a decision on accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. It's a decision on many different things, on doing the righteous, doing the right thing. And the Holy Spirit dwells in your life, and he, he uh, tries to get you to do the right thing because he convicts you on the right thing. Going to church on Sunday, reading your Bible, uh, not swearing, not cursing, be loving toward your, your neighbor and loving toward your enemy. Uh, not not getting mad and fuming over some political issues, but instead be uh, patient and kind and straightforward. Uh, not not returning evil with evil, but returning evil with love. Turning the other cheek. You know, all of these things God is calling you to do as a Christian through the Holy Spirit. Now, he asks you, because you're living the kind of life that you're living, to be a witness to other people around you. And like Paul, people would not even have listened to Paul, except they heard what his message was, and they saw his firmness in that, and they thought, well, let's give this guy a break. It looks like that he's sincere in what he's saying, so let's at least give him a break. So they let him speak. You know, they did let him be heard. Now, if a non-Christian is going to hear the message of Jesus Christ through you, you're going to have to be accepted by them, you as a person. Um uh, you may go up to a stranger and ask them if they're saved and they're going to think you're weird. But if you get to know that person and walk with that person and share with that person and be a friend of that person, then when the doors open and you ask them about accepting Jesus Christ, they're going to be far more likely to do just that. And there have been uh, examples in my life, and I'm not going to go into them, there have been examples in my life that that's exactly what happened. You know, and I, I shared some of those with you a few weeks ago, but um, 